Hello, and thank you for tuning in to my talk today. I would like to thank the organizers and the sponsors for putting together this uh, virtual meeting on cell and developmental biology. My name is Rebecca Adix, and I'm a postdoc in the Madison Martin Labs at Stony Brook University. And today I'll be talking about um, a biosensor that we've adapted to allow us to visualize the metazoan proliferation differentiation decision in vivo. So during development, embryos must both increase in cellular number as well as execute lineage-specific cellular behaviors to give rise to their final three-dimensional form. And the interplay between cellular proliferation and morphogenesis is critical to the successful completion of developmental programs. Multiple cell types across a diverse range of organisms demonstrate a potentially conserved requirement for the cell cycle to be arrested at a specific cell cycle phase during specific morphogenic behaviors. And in fact, defects in the cell cycle or morphogenic movements are associated with many pathogenic processes and are regarded as hallmarks of cancer metastasis. So I'm interested in understanding how the cell cycle is regulated to execute these different morphogenic programs. And in the long term, we hope to understand how and if um, these programs are conserved or how they have evolved across the tree of life. So to give you some examples of different cell cycle uh, regulated behaviors. In the Mattis lab, we're interested in understanding this particular cell in C. elegans, denoted here in cyan. And this cell has to be held in G1, G0 in order for it to invade through the underlying basement membrane shown here in magenta. Neural crust delamination has been debated upon what cell cycle state it is in when it occurs, but it has been shown that these cells can delaminate and migrate in S phase. Epithelial to mesenchymal transition, um, in this case, which you're seeing here in the developing tail bud of the zebrafish embryo, has been shown to occur um, in G2. And cells that exit the cell cycle and go into G0 are quiescent, differentiated, or senescent. So in order to understand how the cell cycle is regulating these different behaviors, we have to be able to visualize the cell cycle state live. So as most of you are probably familiar with the FUCHI-based um, system, which is a two-component colorimetric-based sensor, which allows you to distinguish kind of G0, G1 versus S, G2. However, the delineation between G0 and G1 and the border between S and G2 are unable to be determined. So we turn to a ratiometric biosensor, um, which is a CDK2 biosensor, which was developed in the Meyer lab and um, a lot of work has subsequently be done, been done in the Spencer lab looking at this uh, cell cycle state sensor in tissue culture cells. And this sensor allows you to look at the localization of the sensor across the cell cycle as it moves from a uh, high concentration in the nucleus during G0 um, to highly excluded from the nucleus in G2. So this cell cycle state sensor is uh, at its end terminus, a fragment of the DNA uh, helicase B. And this uh, fragment contains both a nuclear localization sequence and a nuclear export sequence. And the NLS is flanked by pairs of serine residues, which can be phosphorylated by CDK. Um, this is then hooked up to a fluorescent protein so we can assess the localization of this sensor. And um, most of our constructs, we've also um, included a viral cleavable peptide followed by a histone mark so we can uh, use this as a nuclear mask. So in G0, G1, when CDK activity is low, the sensor will predominantly be residing in the nucleus. And as CDK activity rises, the sensor will be phosphorylated. This phosphorylation event occludes the nuclear localization sequence and the nuclear export sequence dominates, leading to peak exclusion of the sensor from the nucleus at G2. And so here, just to show that again, in G0, you have a high amount of the sensor in the nucleus. S phase will be about even between the amount in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And G2, you have exclusion of the sensor from the nucleus. And we can also put a number on this by uh, taking the mean fluorescence intensity of the cytoplasm and dividing by the mean fluorescence intensity of the nucleus. And so we wanted to adapt this sensor um, for imaging in in vivo systems, and we started with C. elegans. Um, 
C. elegans are an awesome model system as they're easily genetically manipulated. Um, they're transparent and great for live cell uh, imaging. And additionally, we know the lineage so we can follow a cell from the embryo through the adult. And so here we've used a ribosomal promoter, RPS27, to drive DHB expression along with our, our histone marker. And you can see that uh, this expresses from the late embryo through adult stages. And we've tried a variety of promoters and fluorophores. So if you're interested, um, please look at our preprint or feel free to contact me for more details. Um, in the Mattis lab, we're particularly interested in understanding this particular region of the third larval stage of C. elegans, or L3. And this region contains uh, multiple tissues, uh, the SM, which is the sex myoblast, um, cells of the somatic gonad, the ventral uterine cells, or the somatic sheath cells, and the vulval precursor cells. And I hope what you can appreciate from this image is that um, DHB is uh, localizing to uh, various levels in the cytoplasm versus the nucleus in different cells. And just to orient you here, what you're seeing is uh, this is the nucleus, and this dark spot in the center is the nucleolus. So in C. elegans, a lot of proteins um, won't go into the nucleolus. So when you see that empty void, that's what that is. And so hopefully you can appreciate that this is reading out that these cells are in fact in different states of the cell cycle as we would expect. And so next we wanted to be able to visualize uh, these dynamics over the course of the cell cycle. And so here I'll bring your attention to this vulval precursor cell. And during the course of this movie, the cell will go from one and divide into two daughter cells. And so here you can see that this is um, in G1 as there's more in the nucleus versus the cytoplasm. And as we follow this vulval precursor cell, it goes through S, G2, mitosis, and then the two daughter cells again will um, have an increasing amount of a DHB in the nucleus as they go back to G1. And we can uh, image many animals and assess the ratio of uh, the cytoplasm to the nucleus to give us a readout of CDK activity. And we can see here that from G1 through G2 uh, before mitosis, the CDK activity increases and then they divide and um, it goes back to an increasing state here as we know that this cell will go on to divide again. So we wanted to ask the question, can we use this sensor to indicate if a cell will in fact go on to divide again or if a cell has uh, differentiated? Um, and so to do this, we continue to look at the C. elegans vulva. So previously I'd shown you this first division here from one to two cells and um, the vulva will go on to uh, divide uh, two more times. Um, and this occurs during the L3 to L4 stages. And however, instead of giving rise to 24 cells, the two D cells denoted here by these green circles um, terminally differentiate one round of cell division early, which results in 22 uh, cells which compose the adult vulva. And uh, these cells are denoted um, as A through F symmetrically around the vulva. And you can see here that strikingly um, that the amount of DHB in the nucleus of these cells is very high compared to the sister cells. And this D cell is the one that will is terminally differentiated and the C cell will go on to divide again, for example. And again, we can quantify many cells from many animals. Um, and we can see here that during this cell division, the D cells exit at a CDK low, DHB ratio low, whereas um, the sister and cousin cells will go to a CDK increasing state as they will divide again before they terminally differentiate. And here again, I hope you can appreciate that these D cells have a high amount of the uh, sensor in their cytoplasm compared to their nucleus, which means that they have terminally differentiated, whereas the sister cells are continuing through the cell cycle, and then later they will divide and be terminally differentiated and therefore accumulate the sensor in the nucleus. And so, like I said, this CD lineage is special because one cell 
differentiates, whereas the sister cell goes on to divide again. And if we look in wild type animals, we can see that here where both cells exit uh, CDK uh, activity low and the C cell immediately begins to increase in CDK activity before it divides again and the D cell remains low. However, um, when we were looking through many animals, we noticed something very striking, and I'll walk you through this image here. So the cyan denotes the C cells and the green stars denote the D cells. And um, these two cells were born recently. As you can see, there's a high amount of DHB in the nucleus to the cytoplasm indicating this low CDK activity state. And as these cells progress, um, this D cell will remain out and the C cell will divide again. However, if we look on the other side of the animal, we can see that the C cell has um, begun to increase in CDK activity. However, it looks like maybe this D cell also is beginning to have an uh, increasing amount of CDK activity. And we notice this occurring in some very rare cases and somewhere between um, 2 to 10 percent of the population based on um, the, the strain of C. elegans we're looking at where the D cell has higher CDK activity than a G0 cell. And so we decided to follow these cells and see um, what happened. And in fact what we observed was is that these cycling D cells go on to divide. And so I'll play this movie here and then I'll walk you through the still images. This is the C and D cell over here. This D cell will begin to um, increase in CDK activity and then it will go on to divide again. And so um, if we look at these still images here, we have our C and our D cell on both sides of the animal. And then this D cell will begin to increase in CDK activity, whereas this D cell remains out as terminally differentiated. This cell continues to enter the cell cycle and in fact divides, gives rise to two daughter cells, and then these daughter cells uh, remain with a CDK activity low DHB ratio low state. And so if we plot all of these animals where we observe this phenomena of the D cell dividing, we can see that they're born into a CDK increasing state, which looks just like their sister C cell, and these cells will go on to divide again. And so this was very striking to us, um, and we're very excited to see this, as it really indicates that we can, in fact, use um, this as a way to predict whether a cell will go on to divide again or whether a cell has entered G0 terminally differentiated or quiescent state. Um, and in looking into this, we were really excited to find that, in fact, this observation had been made um, back in 1986 by Paul Sternberg, where he had observed that a low percentage of animals can have an extra D cell uh, division. Um, but we were able to capture it with our sensor, which was very exciting. And so I've been able to show you that the CDK biosensor DHB can read out cell cycle state and it can allow us to um, observe this quiescence differentiation decision in vivo. And so next what I'd like to do is to tell you some of the questions that were set up to answer in the lab now and tell you a little bit more about that. So um, we want to be able to obviously unmask novel cell cycle dynamics that occur during development. And so um, one of the things that we're interested in understanding, and this is the project of a graduate student, Taylor, in the lab, is looking at cell fate specification decisions. And so in C. elegans, during the second larval stage, there's this very classical fate decision that makes sense where these uh, two cells decide what they're going to become. One becomes that anchor cell, which will invade through the basement um, membrane later, and the other becomes a ventral uterine cell. And um, Taylor has preliminary data suggesting that this uh, fate specification decision is uh, tightly linked to the cell cycle. And as I mentioned before, in the beginning, that anchor cell that we're looking at, which invades through the basement membrane, must be held in G0, G1 in order to undergo its invasive program. And um, now we're set up to uh, really look at uh, the cell cycle state in those anchor cells. Um, and uh, we know that perturbations that prevent these cells from invading and cause them to divide and enter the cell cycle, but now we can look more finely at what specific cell cycle state these cells are in. 
And what I'm particularly interested in understanding is um, the regulation of the cell cycle during cell migration. And so in C. elegans, there's this sexmyoblast cell, um, which provides a really nice model for this. So the C. elegans sexmyoblast, or the SM cell, is a migratory cell lineage. And this SM cell is born um, in the more posterior end of the animal, and then it will migrate 65 microns to land at the center of the gonad. And this cell, there's actually a left-right symmetry here. So there's an SM cell on either side of the worm that migrates to the center. So they flank the gonad. Um, each, each cell will then undergo three rounds of division, and they'll um, differentiate into the vulval muscle and the uterine muscle cells. Um, and so there'll be a total of 16 of these cells in the animal. And these cells are uh, required for egg laying um, of the adult animal. And so we can visualize the SM cells um, here and we can see during the one cell stage and then they'll divide those three rounds and then begin to terminally differentiate into uh, the muscle cells. And so we can pair this SM cell uh, lineage tracer with our DHB cell cycle state sensor and ask what state of the cell cycle are these cells in when they migrate. And so here we can see that we have a high amount of DHB in the cytoplasm to the nucleus, suggesting that these cells are in G1 or G0 when they migrate. And then obviously upon arrival, they begin to re-enter the cell cycle as they'll divide. Um, and so we just also followed these cells as they went through subsequent rounds of division. And here I'm showing you what the sensor looks like in a dividing uh, sex myoblast. So we have one SM cell here, which will divide to two. It's currently in S phase. It'll proceed through G2, M, and then give rise to two daughters that are in going into G1 here. And again, we can compile uh, multiple traces across multiple animals and watch as this cell divides from one cell to two cells and goes to a CDK increasing state before it divides again and has a CDK increasing state. And then upon the terminal differentiation, it exits CDK to low with a DHB ratio of 0 0.22. And this is really exciting for us because if you remember from before, we showed that migration is occurring at a DHB value of about um, 0 0.16. And this suggests that in fact, this cell is in G0 when it is migrating, which is even lower than its terminal differentiated G0. So I'm also interested in understanding uh, cell migratory behaviors and the relation to the cell cycle in other um, animals. And so the next system that we turn to look at is the zebrafish and looking at the zebrafish um, migratory muscle progenitor lineage. So in zebrafish, the mesodermal precursors are the presemitic mesoderm. And during um, development, the proxial mesoderm segments into these somites, and the formation of new somites requires the continuous addition of new cells. And um, these cells are provided by the bipotential neuromesodermal progenitors in the tail bud of the embryo. And um, these neuromesodermal progenitors, or NMPs, undergo a two step um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition before they migrate and then differentiate um, into the somites. And so in order to look at this population of migratory uh, cells, we needed to be able to adapt the sensor for expression in zebrafish. And so here what we've done is hooked up the heat shock promoter HSB70 to drive expression of DHB in the zebrafish. And here you're looking at uh, these early uh, somatic structures, and you can see that the cells are in all phases of the cell cycle. S, G2, and G1 can clearly be seen here. And then if we look at animals at 72 hours post-fertilization, when these cells have terminally differentiated into their myofibrils, we can see that these cells are now all in G0 with a high amount in, of the sensor in the nucleus versus um, the cytoplasm. 
And we can quantify multiple cells across the animal. And we can see here in the early tail bud during development, we have a range of DHB ratios as these cells are exhibiting in all phases of the cell cycle. And if we select out just those cells in the tail bud, which are um, in uh, G1, we get a value here, and we can compare this to terminally differentiated um, cells such as those um, in the myofibrils, which you're seeing here, which gives us the G0 value, which is way lower than this G1 value. So we can, in fact, read out the G0, G1 um, boundary in zebrafish as well. And additionally, we wanted to be able to show that this cell cycle um, Sensor is dynamic across the cell cycle in zebrafish, and so we've used spinning disc confocal microscopy to image from 10 to 12 hours of development, imaging every five minutes, five to seven minutes, and um, we can observe um, cells here. Even in the histone channel, you can see that some of these cells are dividing. And this can be correlated to the DHB ratio. And as I play this movie, you can watch as this animal is developing from uh, gastrulation to segmentation. The tail bud is here on the bottom left, and the forming somites will be up here on the top right, looking at the histones and the DHB. And so we can track the DHB over um, developmental time and look at uh, the CDK activity of these cells in the zebrafish. And we can do some higher resolution microscopy to watch individual cells dividing and really get a clearer quantitative analysis of the activity. And so here I will just play this movie. And if you follow, there's going to be a cell that will divide right here. And so we can track those cells over developmental time and begin to assess uh, the cell cycle state in all of these cells. And so now we're really set up to probe uh, questions to unmask novel cell cycle dynamics during development in the zebrafish. So as I told you, I'm interested in understanding this migratory cell lineage um, in the posterior growth zone of the zebrafish. And uh, the cells will undergo this epithelial to mesenchymal transition and then migrate to join the somites. And previous work has shown that this population of cells must be in G2. Um, and in order to undergo this EMT, and what's really exciting is, is that we see populations of cells in the tail bud that are in fact in G2. And so what we're gonna uh, set up to do now is to pair our sensor with transplantation assays that will allow us to target specific cell lineages and assess the cell cycle state of those cells. And so here you're looking at just the neuromesodermal precursor cells, and MPs. Um, in a transplantation assay. And you can really nicely see individual cells and assess their behavior. Furthermore, um, the posterior growth zone also offers other cool biology for us to look at. So there's a conversion extension event that happens um, uh, in the notochord as the notochord arises from these midline progenitor cells. And these midline progenitors are in G1, which we can see from our cell cycle state sensor. And just like we can do for the cells in the tail bud, we can also look at these cells in these mosaic transplantation assays. Um, and something else that we're interested in looking at is the uh, role that uh, cell cycle plays in regeneration, as regeneration is the reactivation of the cell cycle um, in the growing blastema or uh, in the quiescent stem cells. And we can use the larval fin fold of the zebrafish to assess the role of the cell cycle during regeneration. And what we've done here is perform fin clips at 48 hours post fertilization, and then this is a uh, uh, time lapse with, that was taken in collaboration with the Betzig lab. And um, we imaged at 17 hours post amputation every five minutes for about four hours. And this was you know, the first round of these experiments. Um, and so we're really excited to follow up on these experiments as well and um, really be able to assess the cell cycle state of the different populations within the developing, um, within the, the regenerating uh, fin fold. And so with that, I would also just like to point out that we're really excited to introduce the sensor into a whole host of different organisms. And a lot of this um, work has been in, done in collaboration with the embryology classes um, during the summer at MBL. Um, 
And so we've been able to introduce uh, this sensor into the slipper snail Capridula, uh, sea stars, chicks, and nematostella. And in collaboration with Lance Davidson, we'd also been working on looking at this cell cycle state sensor during Xenopus development. So with that, I would just like to thank um, everyone in the Madison Martin Labs. This project has really been a huge team effort with many people uh, contributing to its success. And uh, I would like to thank my funding um, for my postdoctoral fellowship from NIGMS. And with that, I um, would like to thank you all for listening to my talk and to just let you know if you have any questions um, about this, please reach out to me via email. My email is rebecca.adikes at stonybrook.edu or feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle is at radikes. Thank you.